My name is Jeff DeLisi. I'm the Senior Vice President and Chief Medical Officer here at Virginia Hospital Center. I want to thank you all for coming this evening to celebrate our fifth anniversary as being part of the Mayo Clinic Care Network. We're really excited to be here tonight. I'd like to welcome our speakers, Dr. Mark Larson and Mr. Dan Rulin, who I will introduce to you shortly. And I would also like to welcome several other representatives from Mayo Clinic who have joined us this evening. Lene Markey, Tony Spaulding, and Sarah Christofferson from Mayo Provider Relations. Virginia Hospital Center is very proud to be a member of the Mayo Clinic Care Network. Through this collaboration, we are continuing to build on our foundation as a leader in evidence-based medicine, patient care excellence, and strong organizational performance. This amazing relationship is enabling us to remain a strong and independent healthcare system while simultaneously being able to leverage the latest care breakthroughs, research, and innovations at the Mayo Clinic. Our work together has strengthened this hospital, enhanced the capacities of our medical staff, and most of all, has greatly benefited the patients in our community. We are the only hospital in the Washington, D.C. area to offer such a unique collaboration as the one that we have with the Mayo Clinic. I want to thank Mayo Clinic for recognizing the level of quality and safety that Virginia Hospital Center has achieved. We are grateful for the work we have accomplished so far together, and we are looking forward to great things in the next five years. Many of our patients have asked this simple question, so how does this work? How do I get access to this expertise? The simple answer is, if you are a patient of one of Virginia Hospital Center's physicians, any of our physicians, then you already have access to this expertise. When you came in this evening, you were given a copy of an article the hospital produced that shows our collaboration with Mayo in action. I'd like to ask Dr. Andrew Yol, one of our urologists, to join me at the podium and share with us the story of Mr. Hart and how his ability to reach out to Mayo enhanced his ability to care for his patient. Dr. Yol? Good evening, everyone. Um, you know, it's wonderful to see so many people come out this evening to celebrate not only Virginia Hospital Center's membership in the Mayo Clinic Care Network, but also to celebrate the hospital's striving to complete its mission, which is to be the best healthcare system. Um, this membership, or how I would like to think of it, this relationship, is an example of how the hospital is striving to make available to the community the very best care it can offer. So for my patient, Jim Hart, this relationship with Mayo, simply put, has been a lifesaver. Uh, in 2007, he was found to have an elevated PSA, which is a blood test that we use to diagnose prostate cancer. And a biopsy confirmed that indeed he had prostate cancer. And in September of 2008, he went on to have surgery for a high risk and aggressive form of prostate cancer. Uh, his pathology unfortunately showed signs that that prostate cancer had begun to leave his prostate. And he ultimately went on to be treated with some additional radiation. Nevertheless, his prostate cancer continued to progress slowly until around 2015. And it was at that point that his cancer showed signs of beginning to progress more rapidly. The options for him at this time were few and were really focused more on containment of his prostate cancer as opposed to a cure. And it was around this time that Virginia Hospital Center had become a member of the Mayo Clinic Care Network. And with this newfound relationship came the opportunity to obtain a consultation with Mayo Clinic without having to actually travel to Mayo Clinic. And I suggested to Mr. Hart that we present his case to Mayo in this format. So this is how I learned about a really pioneering treatment strategy that was really focused on cure. And he ultimately went on to Mayo for an evaluation and he had a special PET scan that was able to identify a very small focus of recurrence. And he had treatment with a combination of radiation and chemotherapy. And he is now disease free. He skis several times every winter. He does century bike rides, travels with his wife to Europe. And these are all activities that he would not be enjoying if it were not for this relationship between Virginia Hospital Center and Mayo Clinic. While this is just one example of how this relationship 
has impacted the life of one Virginia Hospital Center patient. There are countless others. In fact, as I speak, I have two consultations in progress with Mayo Clinic radiology and urology departments. I'm grateful to practice at an institution that has such a powerful relationship with the most premier healthcare system in the world. And I look forward to continuing to offer my patients the very best care that I possibly can. Thanks very much. Thanks, Dr. Yolen. Uh, just to reiterate the power of the care network, any patient in our area who comes to any physician on our medical staff, and that can be one of our VHC employed physicians, one of our independent physicians, uh, or one of our Mid-Atlantic Permanente Medical Group physicians uh, with the Kaiser Health Plan, if you come to one of those doctors and either you want a second opinion or your physician has a clinical question, we can take all of the records from the inpatient setting, from the outpatient setting, those office notes, radiology images, pathology slides. We get that all out to Mayo Clinic and they will get it to whatever doctor specializes in the disease that the patient might have. That doctor then actually gets scheduled time during their day to review those records, dictate an e-consult, and send that back to Virginia Hospital Center. Most of the time, there's doctor-to-doctor -doctor communication that goes on via the phone as well. There's no charge to patients, no charge to the doctors, and we're just so proud to be able to offer that to the patients in our community. Before our presentation, I'd like to pause and recognize a few other physicians here at Virginia Hospital Center. The first is Dr. Robert Nerschel. He is our longest serving physician on staff here at Virginia Hospital Center. Among his numerous achievements, Dr. Nerschel, a Mayo Clinic alumnus, was recognized in 2017 as the Distinguished Alumni of the Year honoree by the Mayo Clinic for his leadership in his field. The Mayo Clinic Board of Trustees gives this award annually to acknowledge the exceptional contributions of Mayo alumni to the field of medicine, including medical practice, research, education, and administration. Dr. Nerschel is here with us with his wife, Marianne, and I will ask him to stand and be recognized. Dr. Nerschel. I also want to recognize the invaluable contributions of Dr. David Romnes. Dr. Romnes has played a significant role in supporting and leading Virginia Hospital Center's participation in the Mayo Clinic Care Network. Dr. Romnes personally has a long-standing connection with Mayo. After receiving his medical degree from Eastern Virginia Medical School, Dr. Romnes was an intern and a resident at Mayo Clinic. Actually, Dr. Romnes' connections to Mayo began before he attended medical school Dr. Romnes' late father, Dr. Joseph Romnes, also an orthopedic surgeon, was an active Mayo alumnus and leader, even serving as the Mayo Clinic Alumni Association's president. Dr. Romnes continues to serve this hospital in many ways, including service as a member of our hospital's foundation's board. David is here tonight with his wife, Karen. David, will you please stand to be recognized? Dr. Robness also gave us the, the inside baseball information on how best to travel to Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. So we we're very thankful for that as well. Uh, thank you, Dr. Robness and Dr. Nerschel for your contributions to the field of medicine and to the work we do here at Virginia Hospital Center. It is now my pleasure to introduce you to this evening's speakers. Dr. Mark Larson is the Interim Medical Director for Provider Relations. He joined the staff of the Mayo Clinic as a consultant in gastroenterology in 1989 and is currently an Associate Professor of Medicine as well as Medical Director for the Mayo Clinic Care Network. Dr. Larson has served as the Director of Colorectal, Colorectal Neoplasia Clinic, the Director of both the Gastroenterology and Department of Internal Medicine Outreach Practice, and currently serves as the Director of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy. Dan Rolleen is the Vice Chair of Provider Relations at Mayo Clinic, the group that manages the Mayo Clinic Care Network. Dan previously led the Strategy Management Division at Mayo Clinic's Department of Planning Services, providing strategic planning and market research and analytics insights to support business decision making. Dan holds a Master's in Health and Human Services from St. Mary's University, Winona, Minnesota, and was previously an adjunct faculty member leading master's level courses in population analysis, 
system theory, innovation, and qualitative and quantitative research. With that, I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Larson and Dan. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Well, thank you, Jeff, for that very kind introduction. And thanks, everyone, for making it out tonight. When we left home this morning, it was minus 13. And one of the planes our members were traveling on, the engine wouldn't start. They couldn't get it started. So they had to take a bus to Minneapolis to make the connection. So we're glad to be here for lots of reasons. But I want to start with saying some thanks. I want to thank Dr. Hole for that story. That really probably says it all about what this relationship is all about. So I really appreciate that connection to the story. So thanks. Mr. Cole and Jeff DeLisi have been here on this five-year journey with us when we began our Mayo Clinic Care Network relationship with VHC. And we really appreciate their guidance and leadership and all that they've done to help develop and, and grow their relationship. So greatly appreciate that. Dr. Nershaw and others in, from the alumni side, great to see you in the audience tonight and to hear your ongoing stories of how you're living life to the fullest. Fantastic. Um, I can't believe that you were just in Tanzania a couple months ago and enjoying all those great things. And then to Dave Ramos and his wife Karen. So Dave and I were residents at Mayo together back when dinosaurs roamed the earth a long, long time ago. And Dave hasn't changed very much. He still has the same amount of energy that he did back then. But I, we, everyone knew who knew Dave back then knew that he was going to be a phenomenal physician and, and take care of the patients just the way your dad did. And I think that's probably the highest compliment I can give to you, Dave, that you care for people like your father did. So thanks for being here tonight. Set the stage for the topic tonight, which is to talk about trends and issues regarding healthcare today. And Dan's going to carry the bulk of that, but I'll set the stage a little bit with just some uh, comments about the Mayo Clinic. So these are our objectives for tonight. Not a, a long history, but what's happened the last 10 years? What are trends and concerns that are going to probably shape healthcare providers for this next decade? And how is this going to affect the providers and the staff, as well as the patients at VHC? And again, we really want to talk at length, if we can, about this relationship with Mayo and VHC and how that helps support and enhance the care of patients received here, as well as the community. So a little bit about Mayo. We've been around a long time, 150 years is our history. It began when our tornado hit southeast Minnesota, and Dr. Mayo and the Catholic Sisters of Assisi got together and said, let's work this out, create a hospital, create an environment uh, for patient care. And that's what the last 150 years has been built on. Uh, we're the oldest integrated medical group practice in the world. We were really the first practice to integrate all specialties under one roof. They thought that was a better way to care for patients. And that model has been sustained. And we're now the largest group medical practice in the world. At our three campuses, over 5,000 physicians and scientists, 65,000 employees, five graduate schools, two medical schools. I could go on and on, but the numbers don't really mean anything, but I think it's Messages like Dave Romnus uh, and how he cares for patients that really kind of separates, I think, how we want the Mayo Clinic to be represented uh, in our providers and our patient care. In 1910, this guy, who was Will Mayo, one of the Mayo brothers, was asked to give a commencement address, again, 1910, at the University of Chicago. And he was asked to do what we're asked to do tonight. What are the trends and topics and concerns affecting healthcare? Again, 1910. And his answer was, I thought, was very provocative. And he says, medicine is really complex. There's lots of changing factors. Again, this is back before there were CAT scans or even antibiotics. But he said back then something that I think is still true today, and it really highlights what the relationship with VHC is all about. He said that for patients to have the best care possible, a union of forces is necessary. And by that, he meant physicians and providers working together to collectively use their knowledge to help provide the best patient care. And I think that resonates in our, this is our value statement that was generated over 100 years ago in its exact same primary value at the Mayo Clinic today, and that is the needs of the patient come first. So the, these themes of what's best for the patient is what matters, and working together, collaborating, is really what counts. And if you look at how the Mayo Clinic works, there are, it's different than many academic medical centers. Some academic medical centers use patients to kind of feed their education programs, or the patient practice to kind of feed the research practice. That's the exact opposite of the Mayo Clinic. What drives everything is the practice, the practice of seeing and delivering care and hope for patients. But it's strongly supported by the education and research shield. So 
education is necessary to generate the next generation of physicians and scientists. Research is certainly necessary to generate new cures and transform how we practice. But what's most important is the practice, to be supported by research and education so the patients can benefit from, from that union. This is our model of care. It focuses on how we care for patients, how we work as teams, what values we live out. And every resident, every med student, every provider the, who works at Mayo Clinic, basically this is kind of our, our constitution or our marching orders or our Bible, whatever metaphor you like. But this is how we practice. This is how we care for patients. This is how we care for each other. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dan, who's going to talk more about the topics and concerns that are, are relevant today. Thanks for having us here uh, this evening. Really glad to uh, be with you all and uh, make a few comments. As Mayo Clinic is thinking about uh, the next decade and the next investments in, in resourcing, uh, it, it's worth taking a step back and thinking about the trends and topics that led us to this point, that led us to the development of the care network, that led us to try to connect with providers well uh, far across the country from Rochester, Jacksonville, and Phoenix into Virginia Hospital Center uh, and uh, with Care Network members across the world. So uh, I'm gonna take a, a quick step back in time, share just a few insights into uh, the background back in 2010 or so, uh, and maybe make a few comments about where we've been, where we're at right now, thinking into 2030, and where we're headed in the future, both as a Mayo Clinic and working with Virginia Hospital Center. So I think for a, a nice mixed audience of foundation members, uh, faculty, staff, um, and uh, community members, this sort of context, uh, I'll try to weave all of that together. If you backtrack to 2010 as Mayo Clinic was plotting what the future would look like, you can imagine a fair amount of uncertainty. Uh, think about uh, the, the, uh, the, the rising uh, aging status of, uh, of the boomer class. Um, the, so meaning the US demographic was changing dramatically and that would have an impact on healthcare. There were plenty of other healthcare market forces in play, in, including dramatically increasing costs for healthcare, an aging population, lower reimbursements, some unknowns about uh, healthcare, uh, later to be known as Obamacare and maybe whatever comes next, plenty of uncertainty in terms of how government impacts healthcare. There were, back in 2010, rapid changes in technology. Can you imagine we were saying that in 2010? Uh, uh, think of where we are today. Rapid changes in technology still continuing. And plenty of consumer factors that were impacting the healthcare marketplace, not the least of which is mergers and acquisitions and the consolidation of care in communities all around us, in Minnesota, on the West Coast, and certainly here on the East Coast as well. Competition changes what we, what we do in our practice. And so does consumer choice. So consumer factors are a, a, a fair um, challenge for us all. So in 2010, Mayo Clinic set out on a number of key strategies, the first of which was to assure that patients had a choice in where they could seek health care. In fact, I think this is still one of our key priorities at Mayo Clinic, is to assure that patients who need care somewhere should have the opportunity to choose where they go for care. And so choosing to come to Mayo Clinic, choosing to come to Virginia Hospital Center, choosing to stay at Virginia, Virginia Hospital Center for care should be something that's allowed and the government shouldn't get in the way of that. And that was one of our core beliefs of, uh, of part of the strategy that empowers providers and hospitals. We had a number of tactics that we thought we would implement back in 2010, one of which was impacting the way payers impact healthcare. A second way was uh, impacting the way government interfaces and either gets in the way or helps consumers find health care. And the third method, actually today known as the care network, was bringing support to independent medical practices like Virginia Hospital Center, bringing new knowledge and information into local communities. So uh, really proud of one of these tactics that's ripped right out of 2010 that's living to fruition here in this community today. The Care Network, as uh, Dr. DeLisi mentioned, is, uh, is one of these relationship building components that allows us to build relationships with high quality 
partners. Virginia Hospital Center has high quality care. That high quality care is measured and, and de demonstrated through the work that is performed here on this campus to care for patients. We have an aligned sort of cultural fit and I think that's one of the key attributes that drives clinically meaningful relationships. It's part of what drives the sort of great care across this community. We are committed. We were committed in 2010. We remain committed in 2020 to delivering that kind of expertise into this community to help sustain and differentiate you and the care that you receive here in this market. As we look forward into 2030, there are plenty of other challenges. In fact, I'll put a list on the screen, a list of challenges. As our board was thinking about a path to 2030, our board identified 30 different topics that were driving change in the healthcare arena. So clinicians might recognize a few of these as, as uh, things of concern. Uh, the IT folks in the room might recognize a few others, and I might just pick out a few of them. First, I think many of us are concerned that an economic downturn is on the horizon. Uh, and so if that happens, uh, or when an economic downturn happens, that impacts healthcare, the consumption of healthcare, and uh, what consumers can pay for healthcare. So one example. Number two, low unemployment. Low unemployment impacts the, the kind of quality of staff that we can hire into our facilities. Uh, it impacts the educational arena and the educational workforce. And, uh, and again, throughout all of these, in the macroeconomic arena, in the healthcare market structure, we still wonder about healthcare reform and what happens next. We still wonder about uh, what makes healthcare affordable or unaffordable. My family has had some healthcare dilemmas and we reach this point of threshold that how much is too much to pay for health care? And uh, this is a real question for many Americans and those abroad. And in this third bucket of healthcare practice and innovation, plenty of challenges and change running the field in terms of technology, new partnerships, new startups, new investments in uh, technology to care for our patients, as well as new ways to pay for that kind of health care or maneuver around it. Uh, technology impacts uh, number 30 here. Uh, until this discussion with our board, I'd never heard of a thing called blockchain, uh, a method of uh, tying up data and infrastructure uh, and, and uh, some associated impacts that are on healthcare. So many changes that drive healthcare. There are also market forces that we know are real today. So this is a busy slide and I, I just wanna point out uh, many of us in business would say, gosh, if business isn't great, what can you do to drive more business? Well, you might merge and acquire. You might grow the number of locations that you have uh, in play. And in fact, in the middle of the slide, there's, a, there's one bar that moves from left to right. That's a growth in revenue that's shown from 2012 to 2018, and it's pretty significant. Growth in distributed sites of care. What that slide shows is that across the United States, healthcare organizations that have grown their sites of care have grown revenue, but they haven't improved their margin. They've grown in size. So for those of us thinking about uh, advancing in healthcare, growth in size for growth's sake probably isn't the only piece of the puzzle to think about. Uh, so, uh, so a number of other factors you might draw out of this uh, particular slide, and we'll talk about that with the executive team in the morning. But uh, for us at Mayo Clinic, one of the real challenges we're facing is that uh, on the right-hand side of the slide, where we talk about hospital inpatient revenues across the country are dropping. Hospital inpatient revenues are dropping. What does that mean? It means patients are not seeking care in the hospital setting. In many cases, they're seeking care in the out-of-hospital setting. They're also seeking care in convenience care locations. And for you and I, that means we're finding care before we're really sick. It means we're finding lower cost opportunities for care. And I think as a healthcare organization, it means positioning that healthcare in the right place at the right time for the right patients. So a number of key takeaways there. Here's another, uh, another example of changes in the marketplace. Um, and uh, 
and, and uh, what I'd highlight out of this is that uh, in, in this decade, we can imagine that outpatient surgical volumes will increase by 20%. Outpatient surgical volumes will increase by 20%. What does that mean? It means that our inpatient stays, the way we use our hospital today is going to change. The kind of expectation that, that patients have to be seen in a hospital setting will change. Uh, and most of that goes to an outpatient kind of arena. I might ask Mark to make a comment about this in a, in a bit, um, uh, because I, uh, there, there are a couple of relevant examples in his practice that really drive this kind of point home. At the end of the day, technology is a key factor that impacts care. Technology and the rise of consumerism, the rise of demand for technology, iPhones and smartphones and smart devices is changing how consumers use services. So uh, the bottom line, uh, is a trend chart that shows what happens if you exclude digital tools and services. So, so for those of you who are not using a smartphone yet, this is sort of the path of, uh, of, of uh, community uh, acquisition of services. It's decreasing. If you include all of the digital tools and services, the kinds of smart visits that uh, Dr. Larson and his colleagues at Mayo Clinic are using, that's all growing. What does it mean for providers? It means we need to think about new ways of seeing patients. It might mean video visits. It might mean uh, new ways of, of using technology. Um, but at the end of the day, plenty of changes for us. Trend implications for 2030, healthcare is unaffordable. We have to do something about the cost of healthcare and technology plays a part of it. This accelerating pace of technology, we need to harness it and help drive uh, an opportunity to rise out of that and mitigate threats. Probably third point, as we think of driving change into 2030, we need to recognize that consumers, you and I, as we consume healthcare, have new ways of thinking about that care. You and I have new ways of encouraging our doctors to think about new methods of improving care. Fourth, as a healthcare provider system, we need to think about distributed models of care. There's certainly growth and revenue potential, but there's also some strategy involved in having the right opportunities for patients in the right places at the right time. And lastly, Mayo Clinic is recognizing that we are entering a platform economy, a place in time where consumers need to partner with others to find the answers they need. And in many ways, we think of the care network as one of those platform economies. We're tying providers here at Virginia Hospital Center with tools and resources that they need to solve a patient's complex problem. A platform economy uh, looks a lot like Uber, uh, only different, right? In, in the healthcare space, we're solving real problems, real time, that are really complicated by connecting physicians to information they need when they need it. So we see opportunities with that. Mayo Clinic sees the future rooted in our values. Your values are so strong here at Virginia Hospital Center, just like they're strong at Mayo Clinic. The needs of the patient come first, as Dr. Larson mentioned, that respect, integrity, compassion, healing, teamwork, innovation, excellence, and stewardship all play a role for us. In fact, innovation, as we look into 2030, innovation is our key. Innovation is our opportunity to make a difference and innovation is our opportunity to tackle some of the world's hardest healthcare problems. Innovation will lead us towards some technology solutions that bring platform solutions into play into these markets. We visited with the board and an executive team a bit earlier and talked about how Mayo Clinic is responding. But in many ways, this is how Virginia Hospital Center is also responding. We're building a brand. We're working together. We're working on reputation. We're making a difference in this community. We're bringing that human touch. We're making a difference with patients' experiences. We're, bring, we're bringing great clinical care. We're bringing great clinical expertise into this market, both because of the providers who work here and because of the assets they have available to them. We're bringing new discoveries. 
we're guiding an integrated care model. We're teaching it, and the Virginia Hospital Center staff are living it. It's been so exciting for us to see the kind of growth and opportunity that develops through relationships. As a healthcare system, we see new opportunities as well, a need to bring new capabilities into the marketplace. All of us in healthcare, all of us need to listen more to our customers. Consumers are looking for knowledge, consumers are looking for connections, and you all as business owners and, and uh, members of uh, the community and the foundation uh, see opportunities every day. And we're looking for those kinds of opportunities to work together. It takes new partnerships. It takes new acquisitions. We're looking for information technology partners uh, to bring to bear on the relationship with the care network with Virginia Hospital Center. We're trying to work faster than ever before to solve really complex problems. We're hiring teams at Mayo uh, to solve complex problems. The team at Virginia Hospital Center is hiring teams too. I think they're working on a big project across the way over here. Uh, I see a bit of a hole in the ground. Uh, plenty of opportunity for us to work together. It takes data and, and innovation to drive change. Mayo Clinic has formed a relationship with Google to help drive some change augmented human intelligence, some new ways to think about solving complex problems. It takes new partnerships to do this work using new technology. In 2030, Mayo Clinic is positioning to be a global authority in medicine. In 2030, we're positioning Virginia Hospital Center should be that authority in medicine in this market. In fact, we're positioning that today that's what this relationship is all about, is positioning Virginia Hospital Center as the solution today. We see opportunities in the future to work together to transform healthcare, to bring new discoveries, to innovate together, and to connect millions and millions of people to great information that they need to stay healthy. We see lots of opportunity working together. Our strategic plan looks like this. We intend to cure disease, we're going to connect consumers. We're going to build a platform strategy that transforms healthcare. And I think in many ways, this translates into the work that has to happen at Virginia Hospital Center. The same old days aren't going to cut it. It takes new relationships. It takes new partnerships. It takes new technology. And it takes constant resourcing to be able to succeed. We're living that through this plan. Virginia Hospital Center is living it through your plan. So again, we, as we look forward, we see an opportunity sh to shape the future of healthcare despite 30 uh, challenges in the marketplace. We see an opportunity to work together. Uh, we see an opportunity where benefactors are more necessary than ever before. We see a community that supports an independent hospital. We see a community here in Virginia Hospital Center that loves to provide great care, that works together, that loves to be number one. Or maybe that's just Dr. Delisi, but I think it's everybody here that loves to be number one. We are so proud of the quality scores that come out of this, uh, that, that uh, Virginia Hospital Center has achieved, and uh, we look forward to the future. But uh, Dr. Larson, I wonder if you'd make a few comments before you uh, put, a, put a wrap on this. I, 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 I'm especially thinking as you think about the technology changes and that shift from inpatient care to outpatient care. You and I talked about uh, one of the members of my family who'd had a, who'd had a, a gastroenterology kind of uh, thoracic surgery case uh, that, that was performed outpatient. It was my dad, and my dad was released uh, uh, the following day after his procedure. And uh, I think that would have taken a while longer a few years ago. Sure. You know, there, there's so many examples that we can share, and I'd be glad to hear some more from all of you. Uh, but Dan's talking about a, a condition of the esophagus called achalasia. Anybody heard of achalasia? It's, thanks, Dr. Ramnus. Uh, it's, it's, it's a condition where the esophagus, the lower esophagus, has a sphincter that remains tight. It doesn't relax, and so patients can't swallow very well. So what we used to do was the patient would go to the operating room with a thoracic surgeon, and they would make a huge incision over the chest and the abdomen, then they would cut this muscle, it's about a three centimeter muscle, and that would relax the muscle and allow the patient to swallow. Pretty good deal. Well, couple hour operation, 
maybe two weeks in the hospital, 10 to 14 days was pretty typical, really big incision. Then that patient would go home, and the thoracic surgeon, of course, would have to see the patient back, you know, seven days later, maybe two weeks later, maybe even a third time, to check on their wound, to check on the process, to see if things were going okay. So if that patient lived in California and had to fly back to Rochester, just imagine what this is all about. Big surgery, couple weeks in the hospital, huge incision, couple trips back for a follow-up visit just to check on things. Well, what do we do today? Well, as Dan said, technology has evolved. Operating rooms have evolved. So we now take someone who's an interventional gastroenterologist, and in the OR, with a thoracic surgeon kind of standing by with a cup of coffee, the GI doc goes down the esophagus and is able, through some highly specialized technical equipment, able to identify this sphincter looking through the lumen of the esophagus. They can see the muscle. They can tunnel into the wall of the esophagus, Using a really specialized tool, they can cut that muscle, and they're done. So it takes about an hour. Really specialized skill set, really specialized visualization equipment, manometry, probes that need to find where the muscle is and where to cut and where not to cut. But what does that patient do? Well, now they go home today. And they go home the same day. They don't need to ever come back. They don't have a big incision. So just an example of how, and I'm sure that same process is evolving here at VHC, but we're all looking to technology, not just to provide the same level of care, but a much better level of care. You know, another example is, as Dan referred to, is kind of the telemedicine approach. Our, that thoracic surgeon who said, come back in two weeks so I can see your wound, now uses a FaceTime app, and the patient can scan their wound, show that to the thoracic surgeon. The thoracic surgeon can make key decisions without having that patient miss their kid's soccer game that day. They don't have to travel back. They can get 98% of what they need using their, their phone as technology. Dan made a comment about artificial intelligence. So what is Mayo doing with artificial intelligence? On an earlier slide, you saw the word, there it is right there, AI. And we've all heard about AI and what it might do in our world and how it might identify everyone at the shopping mall by face recognition. Those things are all happening. But what can AI do in medicine? And at Mayo, we are investing really heavily in AI as our platform for more cures. We manage a lot of diseases. We don't cure enough. So, so what's an example of that? Well, if, if we look at how AI can analyze biological specimens, they can analyze blood and cells and lots of information from a patient, we have teams in my neighborhood, the GI docs, who are looking at the pancreas. pancreas pancreatic cancers almost uniformly a killer. About 95% of people who develop pancreatic cancer die from it because we practice 2019 medicine. We wait till someone has symptoms, then they come in, then they have a scan, then the tumor is diagnosed already in an advanced condition. And then the surgeons and the med onc and the radiation oncology team is behind the eight ball. Things are too advanced. Well, what are we working on right now? Well, we're working on using our data and looking at all those patients who have developed pancreatic cancer, but then we're looking back, kind of looking back through a retrospectoscope five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and we're trying to understand what trends started to show up that might be early clues that they were going to develop pancreatic cancer. And the investigators indeed are finding clues. It might be their glucose level, it might be their insulin requirement, it might be other humoral or other metabolic factors that are starting to show up. And we think that's the future, that we can find pancreatic cancer literally before it develops. And if you can find it when it's just a couple cells or a tiny thing, we'll be able to have more cures. We'll be able to find that malignancy, treat it non-invasively without surgery using biomarkers or heat-seeking missile technology, and enact more cures. So just an example of how AI, we think, is a phenomenal tool that we can comb and collect all the databases that are out there. At Mayo Clinic, we have 12 million patients in our database. So we're going to use that so we can detect Crohn's disease before the patient even has symptoms or find pancreatic cancer before the patient has symptoms. That's what Dan's referring to when he talks about more cures. So our, our leadership team has given us the task of we're managing diseases. We're not curing enough. We need to accelerate the process, pick up the pace, use AI, use whatever you have to do 
to get more cures out of medicine. And that's, I think, where the future is really, really bright, leveraging big data. And that's what led Mayo to partner with Google, which we announced this last year, which is going to be a very, I think, a phenomenally uh, productive partner in the AI endeavors. Hope that helps, Dan. Yeah, it does. Uh, thanks, Mark. Good. And uh, so a number of uh, number of other changes and, and things that we're imagining can impact care in the future. Uh, a paradigm shift in consumerism is taking over in, at, at Mayo Clinic, uh, it, so much so that it's not, uh, not that our caregivers are ready to see the patient, it's that patients are ready to see caregivers. This is, this is a phenomenal shift for our providers to uh, uh, become reaccustomed to, that patients are ready to interface with doctors at all hours of the day. In fact, so much so we're, we're not sure exactly how to deal with it yet, uh, but our technology uh, resources are uh, starting to step to the pace to deal with consumers who want to interface with their doctor at all times of the day. Uh, so our inboxes are full and we're trying to deal with that. And, and uh, yet as you fast forward through to 2030, you can imagine a future state that looks different. You can imagine that technology helps us uh, solve patients' problems when they need to be solved. Or it means that they connect with us in new ways. And so this third point of potential responses, both at Mayo Clinic and with uh, our Mayo Clinic Care Network colleagues, we know that virtual interactions are increasing. And so as we find new learnings, we intend to share those learnings. We intend to bring new tools to market and we intend to share those approaches and processes. As Mark mentions, uh, our relationship with Google, uh, Google has some neat opportunities for us as they, uh, they've they really enhanced some natural language processing capabilities. We see some neat opportunities for us to take actually patient requests and incoming patient notes uh, and translate those and compare those with, uh, with other examples that we've seen uh, in, in those 12 million records that, that Mark alludes to. We know that uh, medical knowledge is doubling every 79 days. The, uh, so it used to be, so I'm a little older, when I was in school, uh, the, the basis of knowledge would double every seven years. Now every 79 days, the basis of medical knowledge is doubling. Every 79 days. So it takes some new tools and new resources to be able to consolidate that in a meaningful way uh, and one of those examples might be that pancreas research or pancreas cancer research that Mark was talking about, finding new ways to, to harness new knowledge and focus it on cares and cures. Can I take a point on that? Please. One, if, how many of you have been in a physician's office recently, like where they do their homework and such? Have you seen any books in the office? <laughs> the, the books have gone away because the books were printed a year ago or two years ago, and they're becoming obsolete. The photographs are great, the images are fantastic, but the knowledge is changing so rapidly that everyone's got their information at the touch of their hands on the computer, and the, the books are too old. We, we need to move faster. We need to be more nimble with our information and our knowledge, and so the, the, the libraries are starting to disappear. And I think that's, a, that, that's really a great example of point number five here, and that is that old business models become obsolete. And uh, so in the same way that books are obsolete, some of our other old business models are obsolete. So we need to be aware, we need to be responsive, and we need to use technology in new ways uh, to connect providers elsewhere in a platform way, connect people who need something with answers. And uh, in some ways, that's the care network. In other ways, that's other assets of some partners and vendors and act, uh, things that we acquire to help solve some of those solutions. And in other ways, it's uh, working with great groups like Virginia Hospital Center to help improve care right here at home. Dr. Larson, uh, uh, any, any closing comments for this crew? Well, I'll just say we, we were reviewing with the executive team today the last five years and kind of focusing on the events of this last year. I, I think it's been a five-year great relationship, and I think it keeps getting better. This last year, we had... Uh, a number of engagements where we had speakers from our campus in Mayo come to VHC, talk about breast cancer. We had Dr. Rob Nessie come and talk about healthcare reform. So we continue to see the relationship uh, strengthen and deepen across many levels. But I guess what I'm most excited about is what Dr. Yole said at the start, is those patient connections. This last, I think the last five years, we've had something like over 700 e-consults. 
An e-consult is that ability to share information back and forth between a Mayo specialist and a VHC specialist. And again, as Dan continues to emphasize so appropriately, the, expert, the expertise is here. The care here is fantastic. But to be able to tap someone on your shoulder and say, hey, what do you think of this? Do you agree with this? Is this the best approach? Have you ever seen this before? It might be a rare or unusual condition. That ability to, to collaborate together, uh, I think, continues to grow and strengthen with this relationship. So we've been so pleased to see what this, these last five years have, have developed and grown. We hope that that continues in the years ahead. So I would leave you with uh, three closing comments, the first of which is that uh, we're obviously excited to be here and we're pleased to uh, uh, pleased to have a relationship with Virginia Hospital Center, a great quality organization. Second, I'd leave you with, uh, uh, there are plenty of challenges for the healthcare environment moving forward. Lots of challenges. Um, and uh, they take many forms, some of which are just down the street and uh, at, in DC, and others of which are, uh, are technology-based or consumer-based. Lots of challenges. My third point, though, is that the future looks really bright. The future opportunity to bring healthcare, great healthcare, into communities without patients having to travel is on us. Uh, this opportunity with the Care Network to deliver great insights right to providers here at home helps patients. And uh, so for those of you seeking care here at VHC, we're, uh, uh, we're just pleased and proud to be a partner with Virginia Hospital Center. So thanks for having myself. Uh, thanks for having Mark. Have a good evening. Thank you, Dan, and thank you, Mark. And uh, it's such a privilege for all of us uh, to hear you share your insights on the current and future state of health care. And it's uh, a great privilege to be celebrating five years of partnership in the Mayo Clinic Care Network. Um, it's, it's crystal clear that the way to better patient care is collaboration. We've talked about collaboration between uh, Mayo and Virginia Hospital Center, certainly in, in our own personal experiences. It's, it's collaboration between doctors, nurses, technicians, uh, administrative folks. And I think in the larger perspective, uh, we certainly enjoyed here at Virginia Hospital Center collaboration with our larger community, as witnessed by all of you folks, who over long periods of time have shared your time, your treasure, your energy, your thoughts to help us provide better care to you and your neighbors and to the Virginia Hospital Center community. So collaboration is the name of the game, and we certainly appreciate the collaboration of all the folks who are members of our foundation, Galen Society, Auxiliary, uh, who've been such an integral part of this organization. I'm sure all of you would like to spend some time with our guests from Mayo, and I'm pleased to let you know that there's an opportunity to do that. The Virginia Hospital Center Foundation uh, is sponsoring a reception right now down in the waterfall atrium. I'd invite you to join us for uh, some light refreshment and drink and a chance uh, to chat a bit with our guests from mail. So thank you and we have folks who will escort you down and provide directions. Have a wonderful evening. <laughs>